Welcome to today's webinar, Parking Reform Made Easy, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in association with the Smart Growth Network. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth Network, supported by the US EPA's Office of Community Revitalization and managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In, ad in addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website, smartgrowth.org, that provides current information on effective growth, development, and preservation practices. The website provides news and information about events, funding opportunities, awards, and resources to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is also the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of smart growth. This webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Maryland Department of Planning on smart growth and planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. We are recording this webinar and will be posting it on our website under the Webinar Archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter for smart growth and planning news and to learn about our upcoming webinars. You can also find out about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. The views expressed by the speaker in this webinar are those of the speaker and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning or the state of Maryland. Viewers of this live event are eligible, eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association and 1.5 CNUA CEU self-reported credits from the Congress for the New Urbanism. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event, which is Parking Reform Made Easy. You can also search for event number 920-3097. I would like to acknowledge our partner today, Island Press, and their partnerships manager, Jen Hawes. Founded in 1984, Island Press's mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and protect the environment and to create solutions to its complex problems. So to get started today, our speaker is Dr. Richard Wilson, FAICP. Richard Wilson is a professor in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning at Cal Poly Pomona with teaching and research specialties in transportation planning and planning theory and practice. He is the author of Parking Reform Made Easy and Parking Management for Smart Growth, both published by Island Press. These books provide a strategic approach to parking requirements and management in the context of a sharing economy. Dr. Wilson is also the author of A Guide for the Idealist, Launching and Navigating Your Planning Career, and a forthcoming title, Reflective Planning Practice, Theory, Cases, and Methods. He writes a blog series for the American Planning Association on idealism and planning issues, and teaches APA webinars and Plan Edison courses on transportation planning and planning practice. In addition, he consults with regional and local agencies and developers of urban infill projects, primarily on parking reform and transit-oriented development. Dr. Wilson holds a PhD in urban planning from the University of California, Los Angeles. Following his presentation, Rick will answer as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question anytime by using the questions tool in the control panel located on the right side of your screen. And with that, I think we are going to launch a poll to understand who's in the audience. Okay, so you can see on your screen, the question is the most important parking issue that I address in my work is, and you have four options here. First one, on-street curb parking in commercial districts. Second, off-street parking in workplaces or commercial uses. Third, on-street or curb parking in residential neighborhoods. And finally, off-street residential parking. We'll give you a couple minutes or seconds here to respond. And if you have any questions or problems with that, uh, you may need to exit from full screen mode to respond to it. Okay, so you can see the responses here. 
49% uh, off-street parking in workplaces and, or commercial uses, 20% uh, on-street curb parking in commercial districts, 19 is off-street residential parking, and 13% is on-street curb parking in residential neighborhoods. And now we have one second poll question here for everybody. And to give Dr. Wilson a sense here, uh, which of the following parking situations is the most common in your work? And we have four options here. Parking is oversupplied, not shared with minimal management. Secondly, park, parking is hard to find with minimal use of parking management tools. Third, parking is hard to find with, with sharing uh, pricing and management. And finally, parking demand and supply issues vary with no typical situation. Thanks to everybody who's responding. We'll uh, show the responses here in a second. Okay, and the responses to this, 51% uh, parking is oversupplied, not shared with minimal management. 33% parking demand supply issues vary. 12% parking is hard to find with minimal use of parking management tools. And only 4% is parking is hard to find with but with sharing pricing and management. Okay, so with that, we are going to turn it over to Rick. Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning or good afternoon um, on the East Coast. I'm, I'm happy to be with you here today and talk about parking. Um, I know that in these difficult times of uh, COVID-19 and concern about racial justice, parking might seem like a rather a mundane consideration, but um, the fact that many of you are here tells me it's an important issue and, and in the course of the webinar, I'll, I'll make attempts to connect it to some broader issues um, that we're dealing with today. Uh, thank you for your responses on the, on the, the two polls. I think the content uh, I have ready for you will address most of your interest. The main focus of this presentation is going to be on parking requirement reform, and many of you mentioned off-street commercial parking is a key concern. Um, and also many of you said your parking issue was that parking was oversupplied. Uh, and so reforming minimum parking requirements is a key issue of addressing um, parking um, oversupply. Of course, um, codes are not the only thing that affect parking. So we will spend a little bit of time on parking management strategies that go along with uh, such an approach. I also would like to make a comment on the title, Parking Reform Made Easy. Uh, my uh, mentor and colleague and friend Donald Choup actually helped me with this title. Um, and the made easy part is a little bit of a joke because um, in my practice experience, it's very challenging to change practices in parking requirements and parking management. So it's a little bit facetious, the title. Uh, but my goal is to make it as easy as possible to reform parking. So I'm going to go fairly briskly through my presentation, and, and I look forward to uh, hearing your questions um, and, uh, and, uh, and answering them. Oops. Sorry about that. Sorry, I started with the last slide. Didn't realize we were already done. Okay, so let's begin now. Uh, so here's um, an area near my campus, Cal Poly Pomona in Southern California. It's the Ontario Mills Shopping Mall. And this image shows the typical post-war post -war, uh, land use and transportation pattern. We have single uses, generally sitting in the middle of the site, surrounded by surface parking. And we have parking supply, 
that's sized to the peak use of each, the peak demand of each use. And the result is a tremendous amount of land devoted to parking, um, an inefficient use of land, and on the ground um, challenges in walkability, livability, um, and so on. So that's the most common critique of, of existing parking codes is that they produce this type of environment. Here's what it looks like on the ground. And of course, in a shopping center, usually the parking is sized for one of the busiest days in November, which means that parking spaces are there mostly empty for most of the year. <clears throat> and of course, that area is contributing to urban heat island, stormwater runoff, it's land that is not used for more appropriate purposes. But the issue is not just the suburbs. Here's another place. This is um, uh, uh, South Pasadena in Southern California. And it's a, a walkable, traditional downtown street. And while there are some surface parking lots, parking does not dominate the landscape like it did in the other image. Um, so this has many desirable new urbanist qualities. But in this case, the problem with parking requirements is that they are impeding community revitalization and economic development. In other words, uh, businesses are not able to open because of um, high parking requirements that are skewing the retail mix of this street. That's what it looks like on the ground. My third example, this is Huntington Park, California, and this is a community that was built mostly post-war, and it has residential crowding. And so um, that means that there is a lot of competition for parking spaces. And, I, and what this sometimes produces in communities is a desire to uh, prevent new housing from being developed or to raise parking requirements, which undermines the economics of building new housing. So in this case, higher people density leads to parking anxiety. So I want to begin conceptually by talking about the circle of what I call vice, which is, um, which is the following. When code requirements exceed actual use levels, it has a series of interconnected effects that are self-reinforcing. We end up with site designs that favor the auto, lower density and automobile oriented designs. And these same site impacts uh, make other modes of travel less feasible. When parking supply exceeds demand, the price is usually zero. So um, even though it costs money to provide parking, people don't pay for the cost of the resources they're using. That in turn leads to market norms where uh, developers, lenders, uh, national chain retailers all have high expectations of what a normal parking supply is. If each site has enough parking for any possible use, um, then shared parking is not worth the trouble. There's no reason to do it. And shared parking is an important opportunity because different land uses have different peak utilization times, so, so they can share the same parking space. So this is the cycle of thinking that my work is, uh, and others is, is seeking to break. And my core contention here is that parking is not merely a technical matter where you look up a number in a book to find out what the parking ratio is. It is a policy decision that's profoundly connected to things we care about. So parking requirements are at the intersection of transportation policy as we try to move towards more multimodal transportation, um, questions of design and urban form, um, economic development and sustainability, including social equity uh, uh, and, so, and, and physical activity. So rather than being merely a technical requirement, parking requirements are a key policy choice and I think in working with commissions and city councils, we need to frame it that way so the implications of the choice are understood. So 
<clears throat> some of the problems with the status quo, which is often that parking requirements exceed the actual amount of parking used. Uh, I have mentioned the impact on housing supply. In California, for example, we have a housing supply crisis that's worsened by excessive parking requirements. Um, parking requirements also can disadvantage small infill developers because if they're too high and adjustments are required, it's often that the larger developers have the capacity to work that system, whereas a smaller developer may not uh, be able to work the entitlement system in, through a variance or something like that. I mentioned impacts on small business. In that case in South Pasadena, the only way I knew this is a property owner lent me her commercial storefront for a, for a pop-up art gallery while she was looking for new tenants. Um, she got many expressions of interest for people wanting to do a lunchtime type restaurant, but the parking requirement in the city was 10 spaces per thousand square feet. And this was a historic district where there is no parking on site in this existing building. And so the city perhaps didn't even know that they were thwarting uh, business development and activity and affecting the mix of their district through their parking requirement. And to their credit, they, they made a change. Um, parking also, high parking requirements also lead to gentrification in the sense that if you have to build a certain number of spaces, uh, it makes economic sense to amortize them over a larger and higher end unit. And finally, and you may all have experience with this, um, Parking can be used by those opposed to development um, as a reason for resisting that development. And um, parking crowding can be code language for exclusion of uh, infill development, affordable housing, and other uses. So I think I've devoted a big chunk of my career to, to addressing these issues by reforming parking requirements. So I, what I want to do is put parking requirements in their place. And what do I mean by in their place? I think we need to take a step back and consider what is the goal of transportation and how can we accomplish that goal? So parking requirements are, are a means of accomplishing a goal. So if our goal is access between land uses, connectivity between home and work, home and job, and so on, we can do that multiple ways. We can, can do that with land use planning, both um, with higher densities and with mixed uses and proximity of different land uses to one another to lessen the amount of travel needed and to make walking and biking more feasible. We can do it with telecommunication substitution as we're doing right now during the pandemic, working remotely, shopping from home. And then finally, there, of course, there is physical travel. And among the physical travel options, private vehicle is only one of them. And so, you know, I'm sure you've had many um, seminars on, uh, on transit and human powered transportation in this series. And so you, what you see is parking is way down there at the bottom of a whole series of decisions about how to provide access between land uses. Another way of saying this is that parking requirements are often the tail that wags the dog of transportation planning. Rather than starting with what's our strategy for connectivity and access, parking requirements are just assumed as a normal practice. And so I wanna flip that way of thinking all the way around. So I've been criticizing uh, practices in, in parking requirements. And so the question is, how did this happen? Uh, is it just a matter of, of habits that we developed in regulatory instruments? Um, is it that planners know parking requirements are excessive but use them to leverage negotiations, for example, agreeing to reduce parking requirements in return for some open space or affordable housing component to a project. Um, or maybe we're addicted uh, to our parking requirements. So um, 
there are many reasons uh, why the status quo is gets stuck in place. And in presenting this, I do want to recognize the tremendous amount of change that's occurring across the country and in North America on parking requirements. So it's taken decades to get this moving, but cities are eliminating minimum parking requirements. Cities are uh, lowering parking requirements for certain uses and so on. So there is a fair amount of, of progress, um, but these are some of the reasons why the status quo hangs on so uh, frequently. First of all, um, individuals who have free and convenient parking privileges want to keep them. And so the voice of those who don't drive and park is often less well heard than the voice of those who, who, who want to hold on to that parking spot in front of their apartment or in front of the, the store they shop at. I mentioned the idea of planners tolerating excessive parking requirements because they negotiate them reductions in them for other public benefits. Um, public works and police departments um, with high parking supplies, it, it takes, it takes a, a, a job off their to-do list because there's less need to implement and enforce on-street parking management. Developers, you might be ex you might expect to be a, a, an opponent of minimum parking requirements because they add parking, they, they add development costs to the project. Um, and um, but if minimum parking requirements treat everyone the same, then they're all dealing with the same uh, playing field, and they have no obligation to figure out what the actual appropriate market demand is for parking in a district. The risk of getting parking wrong is taking a, taken away by high parking requirements. And finally, I've mentioned before, uh, groups that are seeking to prevent development know that raising parking requirements is expensive and can undermine the economics of the development project or the pure physical feasibility, especially of infill development on tight parcels. So if it's an addiction, I have a 12-step program. So what I'm arguing here is that um, there are a set of analytical steps one should take in considering whether uh, minimum parking requirements are appropriate and what their level should be. And this is in the context of recognizing parking requirements as a policy decision rather than a technical matter that is solved by referring to, for example, the Institute of Transportation Engineers Parking Generation Handbook. That's a, a book that compiles parking occupancy studies and, and often um, cities fall, uh, look up a number in one of those sources or they call around and look at the ordinances of neighboring cities and say, well, if the city next door is using four spaces per thousand for office buildings, we should do the same thing too. And that's really not policy thinking. And if those other requirements are wrong or distorted, then it's the blind following the blind. So what I'm saying is there are a series of analytical and policy steps to having a justification for a particular parking requirement. And I also think it is not necessary to hire a consultant to do a big parking study to address this issue. So I'm trying to empower local planners to bring forward to their commissions and councils recommendations to reform parking requirements. So here are the 12 steps. I'm gonna go through them very briefly. In the book, there's chapters that articulate more how to do this, but let's, let's have a look. This slide shows the first three steps. The first issue is we need to have a, an analytic basis for understanding how parking is used. And um, often, uh, some sit, in many situations I've been in, the city number one did not even have an inventory of the total private and public parking in their downtown. And two, 
did not know the utilization rate. So what is the peak utilization rate? Time and time again, I've worked for uh, smaller cities in their downtowns where the stakeholders say parking is completely jammed, no one can find a place to park. We do a utilization study and find out that the peak utilization is 60%, which is not full. Why is there such a difference between the perception and the reality? It's because the 40% of spaces maybe are less visible behind a building. Uh, they are not available to be used because they're not shared. So there are reasons for the difference between the perception and the reality, but it's very important to have that analytic basis. Now, of course, um, manually counting parking can be expensive. Uh, but there's a lot of ways of, of lowering um, parking using transportation, social parking demand. This is data the American uh, has a vehicle of it. It's free, it's available. And using these such as such as been used uh, for measuring occupant gate arm entry. One is to have in the district your your caveat to this. they are referring lots of parking availability and parking being free. So it's not exactly a demand level that you're observing or it's a demand level at a price of zero often. So the true demand at the market price would be lower than, than you would measure in the existing situation. Step two is considering the future. Because this is a planners codes are, are requiring a capital investment either uh, in land for surface parking or in structure or underground parking. This is a long-term decision that must consider long-term trends. And those include trends in demographics, uh, technology, economics, culture, and, and I've added here responses to COVID-19. So, most of the trends that I observe suggest declining parking utilization rates in the future. That, for example, the uh, shared mobility, uh, Lyft and Uber mean that perhaps people will choose to have fewer cars per household, which can affect parking demand. Um, the only trends that suggest parking demand might go up well, one of them was office uses, which are moving towards, away from individual offices and towards shared use, which might increase office densities. And the other question that we're all wondering about is how will people respond once vaccines access to COVID-19? COVID-19 gonna to lead to less use of transit in the future, more desire to drive, which could increase parking demand. I don't think we can know at this point, um, but one would have a discussion with commission and council about the variety of scenarios for and how they would have parking. To the third element, in the weeds, but it's the way that assumptions requirements. Additional guidance on um, you set the requirement value. We're requiring of the time where 15% of the time where a development would not have enough parking. And that's an extremely wasteful practice. And the risk of having a project not having enough parking can be diminished with parking management strategies such as shared parking. So um, that's a decision and a policy decision to make. 
The next step is to consider the project and the context of the district it's in. And if you just look at household vehicle availability across urban space, it's widely varied, right? In urban areas, people own cars because there are alternatives to parking is expensive. In urban areas, it's higher. There can be such thing as a standard for, for a particular use because it really does depend on land use and transportation characteristics in the district. Step five is, is the parking gonna be free? Is it gonna be priced? And so the three concepts here, pricing is, is what it means that you pay a monthly or an hourly cost to use a parking space. What unbundling means is that when a developer traditionally, or, I'm sorry, an employer traditionally rents an office space, a certain amount of parking comes with it in the lease. They don't pay separately for the parking. Unbundling means let's separate the amount of parking you want to purchase from the space. Same with uh, residential apartments. We're starting to move towards unbundling in which a tenant would say, I'm paying $2,000 rent for this space and I would like to rent one parking space for $70 a month. What unbundling does is make people aware of the real cost of parking and price elasticity studies show that as price goes up, parking demand goes down at a roughly negative 0.3 elasticity. So uh, that's unbundling. Cash out is a concept used in workplaces where an employer would say, I've been giving you free parking, but I've entered into a new arrangement with my landlord so you can have the free parking or you can have the cash value of that parking space that I would that I'm spending like let's say $50 a month. So this is a way of introducing an opportunity cost without taking away free parking. So all three of these concepts in number 5 here are ideas of making the driver perceive the cost of parking rather than disguising it in costs that appear somewhere else. And so when drivers have to pay for parking, they park somewhat less. And so many years ago, my PhD dissertation was looking at uh, whether paying for parking affected travel mode choice to commuters to downtown Los Angeles. And indeed, it turned out that it did. The sixth element is what's happening with transit, pedestrian facilities, bicycle, car share facilities, and so on. All those things can reduce parking demand at work sites. They can reduce the level of vehicle ownership uh, in residential developments. Step seven, again, kind of in the weeds, but if you rent an apartment and you have a parking space assigned to you, that means when you're not in the parking spot, it, no one else can use it. So whether or not the parking inventory is shared affects how much parking you need. If it's not shared, it's less efficiently used and the requirement would be higher. So moving towards pooled shared parking in individual land uses and, and across land uses can affect how much parking you would want to require in a parking code. Step number eight, you still with me, I hope. Uh, we're almost done, the 12 steps. Uh, Off-site parking. So in a neighborhood near where I live, there was a lot of restaurants developed, an existing built form, no way to provide the off-site parking. So the city decided to count on-street parking towards meeting the requirement for the restaurants. So this could be either using a pool of on-street parking or using other underutilized parking. So I don't know, an example in Orange County in Southern California, Angel Stadium where the baseball stadium has a huge parking lot that's used very fully during games, um, but those spaces are empty most of the rest of the year. Question is, can they be part of a shared parking inventory? Step nine is internal shared parking. This is the idea that if you move from a single use site, like the image I showed you right at the beginning, to mixed uses, 
you can have the different uses share parking because their peak demand times are different. So for example, if you had an office complex with a movie theater, the movie theater's parking demand is uh, at mostly in the evening and on weekends, and the office component is mostly uh, during the weekday. Similarly, if you had a, a multifamily housing project across the street from an office building, the multifamily residential project has the highest parking demand overnight when the office building's parking demand is, is quite low. So um, that's not internal, that's across the street, but the idea is if you had them in the same site, you can have less overall parking. So those nine steps are things I think we should think through when we're considering whether to have parking requirements and if so, what they should be. But I contend that those nine steps do not simply lead to an answer. The answer the nine steps first produce need to be compared against the community's goals and objectives. What is, what is the most important um, things the community is striving for? So for example, Buffalo, New York eliminated minimum parking requirements. And I think it was partly because um, economic development was a significant priority for that community. So those nine steps might be iterated many times in terms of thinking about how well they support the vision of the community. I have two more steps that don't relate to the requirement itself, the number of spaces per thousand square feet, and those are space size and different space uses. So in space size, codes also establish the size of the stall, uh, whether or not compact spaces are allowed, aisle widths, maneuvering, and so on. And in my practice with developers, often very desirable infill development projects run into problems because of site constraints that high minimum sizes make worse. So this is not to say, uh, you know, it, again, it's a policy decision, but you can carefully look at whether those minimum sizes have been carried over from assumptions from 50 years ago or whether they're appropriate today. Now, the other thing is, this is where parking management comes into it. If you're worried about large vehicles, and we still have, you know, a big share of the auto market is pickup trucks, which are quite large. Um, do we make all the spaces large to, to make sure those pickup trucks have enough room, or do we have two space sizes and a management allocation system to make that work? Perhaps that would be more efficient. The last step in our 12-step journey is various ways of making parking take up less land area or building area. So, Tandem spaces is when usually used in residential environments where a parking space, one parking space is behind the other. So in a two bedroom unit that had two parking spaces, um, that saves uh, land devoted to aisleways. Now people would rather not have that, of course, because somebody might have to move a car occasionally, um, but it, 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 it contributes to the efficiency and of, of parking provision. Valet parking schemes um, can pack the cars in more densely and produce more parking per area of parking lot. And of course, mechanical parking schemes in high land cost areas um, can produce many more cars parked per, um, uh, per square foot of parking area. So here is... Um, uh, a diagram, and it's not a, a radical diagram uh, in the sense of recommending zero parking requirements. This is the case of an office building in a suburban area going through those nine steps. And as I said before, the typical parking requirement is four spaces per thousand square feet. This exercise with the adjustments made for this scenario ended up at three spaces per square thousand square feet. Now the difference between four and three 
is just one number. But that's a huge difference in land utilization because you're reducing the amount of parking required and if, it's, if it was surface parking by 25%. So the book has examples of this for commercial development and residential development. All right, so um, some of the approaches to reform that are happening across the country are, um, they're varied from the most extreme is eliminating minimum parking requirements. And the traditional, as I mentioned, is the minimums generally exceed the actual amount of parking used on the average development, trying to anticipate any situation where a single development did not have enough parking. So you can see a variety of approaches here from um, trying to reduce wastefulness by lowering parking requirements to more closely to the expected utilization rate. So this, this involves considering those factors in the 12-step in the process. In some larger cities, um, they are keeping minimums, but making them lower, less than the expected utilization, considering that the larger parking market will take care of the demand. And in some cases, introducing a maximum, which prevents any individual developer from building uh, more than a certain amount of parking. And then the partial deregulation approach is there's no minimum, but a maximum exists, again, to uh, prevent a developer from building an enormous parking facility with a project. I'm not that, I understand the reason for maximums. I'm not that crazy about them because I think there's a financial penalty to a developer to overbuild parking. Um, and if they do overbuild it, there's an opportunity to um, to share that parking with future developments that might not build any parking. So I think the real the reason for maximums is to prevent undesirable impacts on traffic, the pedestrian environment, having too many uh, too much flow in and out of a parking facility. So, um, but that's a that's a choice that some communities make. There are also many other provisions, bells and whistles of parking requirements. Um, on the left is a list of, of things um, that it's ironic that we, as planners, we require parking and then we require that the developer tame the impacts of parking. So an example would be uh, surface parking produces high rates of, of runoff and polluted runoff. So uh, permeable pavement would reduce the intensity of runoff um, and strategies that capture stormwater and clean it on site um, reduce the pollution effect. <clears throat> Parking structures can be very uh, deadening to the urban environment and the experience. So requiring ground floor retail uses in a parking structure is an example of trying to reduce the negative impacts of parking. And on the right-hand side, you can see a whole bunch of uh, wrinkles in supply regulations. I've, we've discussed minimums and maximums, but in tandem, but um, requiring electrical vehicle parking for recharging, bicycle parking, uh, a whole series of uh, strategies. Um, I'll point out two bullets from that list. <clears throat> Performance-based parking is, instead of establishing a fixed ratio, having a development agreement that runs with the land so that the developer builds a certain amount of parking, and if demand turns out to be higher than anticipated, there's an obligation to address that either through alternative transportation programs or finding a shared parking resource to use for the development. So an obligation to manage the parking for the site that runs with the land rather than, um, uh, than simply a fixed requirement. And the reason planners require too much parking sometimes is that's their only chance to make sure that the transportation conditions on the site are addressed, right? If we move towards more of a performance-based system where there's an ongoing obligation of the developer and future property owners, <clears throat> 
to make sure the transportation access is working, that reduces the need to require a lot of parking of everyone to account for. You know, I did a study uh, a while ago of different office buildings and, you know, I found that the average peak parking utilization was a little over two spaces per thousand, whereas the requirement was four spaces per thousand. But in fairness, I found one site, which was a credit card processing facility, where the parking demand was 10 spaces per thousand, and that was because very high employee density in the building. So this idea of performance space can address uh, the variability of projects and projects over time. The in lieu idea is that you would, in, if you had a site where it was very difficult to provide the code required parking, you would pay a fee to the city who would then either cause shared public parking to be built with that money or use that money to fund alternative access programs. So that's a way of um, uh, uh, <clears throat> addressing unique site situations that make it difficult to meet code requirement. So that's most of the story in my Parking Reform Made Easy book. And um, when I when I wrote the book and I made presentations to planners and uh, city officials, some of them said, yes, we know that our parking requirements are, are greater than the actual parking use. But when we propose that to commissions and council, um, people come in and say, if you do that, parking will overspill from a commercial area into my residential neighborhood. Um, and so what I realized is parking requirement reform and parking management have to go hand in hand. If you don't have a parking management program, you don't have a very good answer to constituents' concerns that a lower or eliminated parking requirement will not create parking chaos. So the two concepts really go hand in hand and that spurred me to write Parking Management for Smart Growth. So this is an overview of the, you know, the basic choices with uh, parking management. So on-street parking in commercial districts, traditionally there have been a very simple set of time regulations, right? So you don't want, um, you don't want an employee of a retail business to park in the very prime spot in front of the front door of the store. So a city might have a two hour time limit to prevent that from happening. The idea being that space is a space that should turn frequently and by having a time limit, you can induce the turnover. Um, communities also have traditionally had pricing of, of on-street parking um, uh, through, through parking meters and the technology has advanced so that, you know, coin meters were, were very problematic and now we have uh, meters that can take credit cards, pay by sell, and um, that can vary the price by time of day. Dynamic pricing is when you change the price by time of day with reference to a very specific location. So the concept is that you are, are seeking to create more parking availability and reduce cruising for parking. So if in a district, let's say, the parking is the same price throughout the district, there will be competition for the most convenient spaces. Everyone will be searching for those spaces. And there is no financial reward for parking a block away and walking. Dynamic pricing says let's adjust the price by time of day and by, and by block face to try and produce availability in all locations and help sort out those from uh, making a very quick trip. They're willing to pay for an hour's worth of parking to go in and out of the store versus someone who will park a block away or in a parking structure because they're going to stay for four hours. The other thing with on-street parking in commercial districts that's changed in the last couple of days is the great competition use of the curb. So traditionally, the curb 
We're parking it into two hour putting unloading. Much greater and and we have um, using the and so it's a flex set of demands. Of course, as well, non-parking uses want to claim that curb area. People want to develop bike corrals, bike park, parklets, parking to and and questions. So used is saying finding ways to have curb allocations that might change um, throughout the day. And finally, uh, parking benefit are using pricing. Um, said, well, we don't, it's going to check customers would threaten to never come back. But when the revenue from the parking is used for district improvement, street cleaning, improvement, other things, it's a much different story. Parking benefit just turns some or revenue to um, community uses. Neighborhoods, relatively un be a 72 hour can be parked on the street. Go up, there begins, especially if the garage into a and so their cars are on the street. So the traditional approach cities use is a residential permit program uh, in which permits are allocated at a nominal cost for residents of the community. Both can have the effect of keeping out spillover of commercial parking in the neighborhood and then limiting simply the number of people that are entitled to park in the district. I'm very much in favor of bringing price to residential, and I, um, the um, they're often so cost program value of um, in residential areas. For off-street parking, um, when there's that first image I showed you of Ontario Mill, um, um, there, there are no individual sites may have signage that says this, this parking is for this use, but it's pretty much a hands-off system. As density grows and parking demand grows, gate arm system, license plate reader use, um, and then spaces are allocated to different users. <clears throat> so for example, if you had a mixed use development of office building and a theater, you would assign the office building parking to the upper stories and the theater and retail parking to the lower stories because if you're parked all day long, it's certain to go up a few levels in the parking structure than a quicker uh, retail visit. And of course, we also allocate space to kept access, vehicle recharging, or short-term pickup and drop-off, and so on. Similarly, uh, off-street parking can have should have pricing reflect the cost of its provision, and dynamic pricing is appropriate there as well. Um, and then the big opportunity with parking is having parking arrangements in projects have been built in the middle of park to to share so thinking about when Parking are similar. City builds an off 
And they said, than the on-street part. Thing is very crowded. For long of, rather than pricing to repay the bonds of a specific facility, thinking of a parking district that produces a certain amount of revenue that will repay those bonds, but pr <clears throat> produce greater satisfaction on the part of the people using the parking. So the goal of parking management is to manage a benefit. And you see here is a picture. This may be a parking space that is never used or hardly ever used a parking space that someone is storing a car that they really think they should but haven't had to and they don't basically car store. The same physical short visit retail restaurant parking for a household. Is the idea of space well. I think this point was driven home to me when I was a graduate student and I purchased a number of almost not running cars from uh, my father-in-law and I had them stored on the streets of East Hollywood and rarely drove them. Why? It didn't cost me any to move them for street cleaning day. No financial incentive for me to own extra cars and park them on the street. That, you know, that's my uh, potential pricing is a no disincentive those cars. So basically, this is the same. These scenarios have a management is. Towards and higher example of a low is um, a sports stadium where sometimes parking is 99% full when there's a, a game going, but other times uh, there's not. I'm seeing messages that we're not getting the audio. Should I do something? Hey, Rick. Uh, yeah, this is Michael Bayer. Um, is it would it be possible for you to call in on your phone on the call in number that was provided in the? the yeah, uh, I can do that. Mute also, your uh, in, computer. It will be found in your audio. Mute your computer. The audio tab. Sorry. We're going to see if we can get Rick to call in here and then continue with his um, presentation from this point. We apologize for the, the uh, technical issues. Hello? Hey, Rick, we can hear you now. Can you hear me? Okay, let me. Uh, yes. So is my mic turned off? Go forward from here. Okay, so I should continue? Yes, please. Okay, so we're on the slide uh, showing the goal of parking management being to increase the intensity of use of a parking space. So, so in a way, rather than be anti-parking, I'm anti-wasteful parking. So this shows what the general goal would be. Um, but I use this 
dangerous waters sign to, to de indicate that um, parking uh, management uh, creates controversy and it's something we have to we have to think of how to navigate carefully and in, in trying to understand why um, what I've observed when I make presentations to communities is parking isn't just uh, and parking management just not a a technical matter it's related to what the, the meaning of the community and so one way I have of explaining this is in a small town you park on street in front of your destination you drive to the hardware store and you park in front of the store and you do your business you park free generally um, city makes developers provide parking off street parking for private land uses is theirs no one else can use it and neighborhood parking is exclusive to residents so if that's what a small town is like in a big city people don't park right in front of their destination um, they pay for parking um, the city facilitates private and public provision of parking off street parking is shared and neighborhood parking is shared so this is a huge transition from being a small town to being a big city so i've worked for you know cities that are small in in la county which is 10 million people they view themselves as a small town but they're in a county that's 10 million people so this is the challenge of helping stakeholders accept and understand that change happens and that the big city approach has many advantages and attributes that can make things can make things better but that's that's what's going on behind the scenes so all the technical studies in the world aren't going to fully address the the concern with my communities changing in a way that i don't like and so this is why the work of parking reform is so challenging fortunately for parking management there's all sorts of uh, tools that are available and smart parking meters mechanical parking integrated systems so there's a great variety of tools but what i've noticed is many applications of parking management are ad hoc sometimes the private and the public par parking operators are not coordinating sometimes as i mentioned before the on and off street parking pricing schemes are out of whack and don't make sense and what i notice is in many communities it's um set it and forget it basically yeah we established these rules 15 years ago it's kind of controversial to bring them up so we're just going to leave them alone so when i was younger there was infomercials for this rotisserie cooker um, and the crowd when the cooker was presented always said set it and forget it so i'm opposed to set it and forget it for parking management here's another example where this parking sign regulation has been here so long that a tree grew around it so that's that's not good practice and also when i say parking management there are many ridiculously complex forms of it and this image shows a parking sign in culver city california it was only up for three days uh, somebody took a picture of it and was blogging about it and the city manager got got embarrassed but this is a parking management scheme where the only thing you know for sure is that um, you're going to get a parking ticket for something so this is an extremely complicated allocation system that is not the desired approach for parking management so the logic of parking management is to in, excuse me a garbage truck is here so i will wait till he finishes his work um, to increase the amount of time parking is occupied to improve the space search experience and to provide people choices in price and convenience a trade-off between convenience and how much you pay and then uh, eventually repurpose parking to better uses because of course it's like curb parking is the sacred cow it's nobody can touch it but now 
we think of putting in bus lanes, bicycle lanes, public space uses, and in response to COVID-15, um, moving restaurants outside into surface parking lots and into sometimes the, the public right-of-way um, are arguably better uses of that space. So there's three levels of how it works. The first is parking management can reduce the quantity, the total quantity used by um, pricing parking or incentivizing travel demand management. Once that's shrunk a little bit, then efficient space use can further reduce the amount of parking needed. That's the idea of shared parking, for example. If you share parking, you don't need the, you're using the inventory more efficiently. So the size of these circles is not representing any particular place, it's hypothetical, but the, the concept is usually stakeholders perceive that the big circle is what's needed to make a district or a community work. And through parking management, the, the quantity can be reduced while still providing uh, customer satisfaction. A, a, a short comment on politics and participation. Of course, because this involves the community's sense of itself, you can't just do it with a technical study. You do need to engage stakeholders and bring them along. So this is what I've learned in this process. First of all, it's very e much easier to link parking reform to a broader planning agenda. So if I worked in a city where we were proposing um, pricing on street parking and the council member said, if you proposed this three years ago, I would have said definitely not, but we have a new specific plan for our downtown with a vision of walkability and this and that. And so now I see that the parking strategy supports it. Second approach is education. Um, and certainly I'm, kind of provide education today about the status quo and why we should change it. But I do know that many people do not want to be educated about parking reform because they want to hold on to the status quo. What often works though is showing best practice, taking commissioners, council members to visit a district that's reduced parking requirements and using parking management tools to show them how well it can work. The third idea is to appeal to self-interest, that um, uh, uh, city managers, in the case of South Pasadena, perhaps didn't realize they were losing tax revenue because restaurants couldn't locate in that district because of the high parking requirements. Um, so there are many of those who would benefit by reform, and also we can compensate those who are disadvantaged by reform, for example. If you did priced residential permits in a neighborhood, some you could provide a rebate to low-income drivers in that neighborhood who otherwise would experience a regressive impact in terms of their uh, total cost of, of transportation. And finally, we can attract allies for parking reform, transit operators, infill developers, a long list of, of groups there who who would support um, planners working on parking reform because it would help their agenda. This is a parking structure in, in, uh, in Florida. I just show it because it's this idea of moving away from a, uh, a facility designed for a single purpose toward facilities that are adaptable. They have concerts and weddings on some of those high, high floor stories. Uh, it's got retail in the middle of it. Somebody's living at the top. It was very expensive to build, obviously, so this is not something you do everywhere. But this idea of moving away from parking as a single commitment to just doing that, it's the whole life of the structure, and towards a repurposable building, such as um, parking. The key feature here is level floors, which means you could you know, convert more of this structure into housing if you wanted. So there's a lot going on nationally. Um, I mentioned Buffalo, New York eliminated minimum parking requirements. 
many other cities are doing it for part of the city or in particular land uses. Um, curb management and dynamic pricing is happening in many locations. Four notable cities are San Francisco, Los Angeles, that both got federal grants to do dynamic pricing. Seattle, which has a simpler system, but lower cost to implement. Washington, D.C. is using uh, cameras for occupancy measurement. Uh, the market pricing of curb parking in residential areas, Vancouver, British Columbia, and Portland, Oregon have done that. And also reviewing environmental review procedures uh, in California, our environmental review law was changed to take out parking as a possible impact on the initial checklist that you use to determine if an EIR is required. Um, so these are the links to the books that I've written on this, um, and there's a 30% discount if you use the webinar discount code at Island Press. And of course, I'm not the only one. Uh, my friend and colleague Donald Shoup uh, wrote The High Cost of Free Parking, and more recently edited a volume called Parking in the City. Um, and also I would note that uh, the International Parking Institute has produced a volume called The Guide to Parking that has very much operational practical uh, uh, chapters on parking supply and management. I've done a lot of research on this and I'm not gonna spend any time on this slide, but it, this will be available to you if you want to follow up on particular issues in parking. Um, and I think I'll conclude with this slide, which is uh, um, downtown Los Angeles in front of the farmer's market. And this is an area where I used to work in redevelopment in downtown LA and <clears throat> where those people were sitting was curb parking. This is a temporary repurposing of that curb parking for public space. The city has a goal of building a streetcar eventually on this, on Broadway. So if you'd have asked me when I was working at the redevelopment agency, would you ever see a day when people are sitting in curb parking spaces eating lunch? I would have thought perhaps not. Um, but this shows that we're in the in the in the period of of change and innovation in how we deal with parking. So it, with that, I'd like to um, ask you if you have questions or comments that I can address. Great, thanks, Rick, and thanks everybody. Uh, kind of working through some of the audio issues that we had during the presentation. And um, Rick, if you're still uh, connected. Why don't we see if your webcam works since you are calling in, that shouldn't affect the audio. Uh, and I ended up calling in as well. So I think that's all work pretty well and we can see you on the screen. So that's excellent. And uh, thanks to everybody who sent in questions. I mean, this is obviously a, uh, a topic that has attracted a lot of interest. Uh, we lost some folks with the technical issues, but we still have more than 700 people online and lots of questions. Um, so we'll go to at least, uh, 2.30 Eastern and maybe a little longer if you have a little bit more time, Rick, to answer some of these questions. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Well, I'll just start here kind of at the beginning here uh, from earlier on in your presentation. The question here is, uh, is how might we incentivize zero parking as a development practice? I am thinking about facilitating a living building challenge as a best practice. how to incentivize zero parking um yes i think i think one of the ways is using parking management tools to provide developers with a feeling of risk reduction of not having enough parking so um uh, it's not only the developers it's investors and lenders who may have standards and ratios in mind about how much parking should be provided, and if it's not, it makes the project riskier and harder to finance. So if a, if a community has a game plan, um, has an inventory of parking, has a strategy of how shared parking will work, that can help reduce the reluctance of developers and investors to build projects with zero parking. Um, for example, if there's an agreement that a nearby property will share parking under certain terms and conditions, should it be needed, that, that would be one idea. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question here is uh, curious uh, if you could allude to issues related to possible autonomous vehicles requiring 
requiring even less parking in urban environments and use public space for pedestrians and bicyclists, parklets, and so on. Yeah, so there's been a lot of uh, thinking about that. Um, you know, the, the, the bottom line of parking demand comes from a household deciding to own a car. Uh, so one question with autonomous vehicles is, will you still want to own one or will you simply want to use one? So there could be a very significant reduction in residential um, uh, household vehicle ownership if autonomous vehicles are widely used because they become more of an appliance, more like an elevator than a personal expression that the car can be. Now, one of the questions and the worries is what will those autonomous vehicles do as they're uh, waiting to pick up new, new drivers? And so a lot of researchers have been doing simulations and other things. I mean, you could have situations where autonomous vehicles drive outside of a business district and flood a local neighborhood with temporary, by parking there temporarily till they get reassigned. Um, will we make the autonomous vehicles park? Uh, will the autonomous vehicles clog up traffic in downtown streets by circling around the block waiting for you while you go to the gym? So I think what I'm hearing from most researchers is we need to price the use of autonomous vehicles appropriately so we uh, we don't end up with um, traffic congestion problems that, that are serious. But I But I do think the future direction with autonomous vehicles as they're available, perhaps initially more as neighborhood vehicles than for all trips uh, is a reduction in household vehicle ownership, which when that happens, reduces parking demand throughout all uses because you no longer have a car you're driving to the store, you're either having your stuff delivered or you're using a autonomous vehicle to get there. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question here is from George Homewood who asks, from a policy perspective, is it reasonable to consider residential parking as more necessary than non-resident residential parking? In other words, can having parking minimums for residential uses be justified while removing non-residential parking minimums? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, the justification, so the, the issue here is that having a vehicle provide significant benefits to a household, right? So carless households have less access to um, different job opportunities, a reverse commute, like you live in the central city and there's jobs in the suburbs, but the transit system does not get you there. So there clearly are some social benefits from vehicle ownership, um, but um, there's also alternatives to it. So I guess what I would be interested in exploring is starting again with what's the basic goal? Is it that people can get to work, healthcare, education, shopping, and so on? And is requiring parking at a residential development um, important, the, the best way of accomplishing that goal? If there's a better way, such as neighborhood level ride sharing to get to suburban workplaces, or other forms of mobility, I think those those should be considered. So um, the other thing is with that is allowing people to sort themselves out. So some people do not, are, some of my students, when they graduate and become planners, they wanna live a car-free lifestyle. So maybe you have parking requirements in part, part of your community, but maybe not in others, because we really haven't provided the option of a car-free apartment when we require all apartments to build those requirements. So, um, uh, and but and so, in, but in agreement with the question, um, in terms of priority for mandates, if you were only going to mandate uh, one land use, I can see the logic of the question. Okay. Thank you. Um, next one here is uh, when commercial area parking requirements are reduced, residents on nearby streets often complain that customers are taking the on-street spaces in front of their houses, making it difficult yeah. for guests to park. How do you address this? Yeah, so that's a that's a common uh, concern and issue. And so 
the, the simplest way is a residential permit program, which would prohibit commercial visitors from parking in the neighborhood, either all the time or certain times of the day. Um, a more nuanced uh, response is, um, are there areas where that's appropriate, but the commercial parkers would pay to park and those revenues would return to the community for park improvements, programming, um, street cleaning, tree trimming, other, other benefits. So um, uh, Boulder, Colorado did a program like that where instead of prohibiting overspill, they allowed it, but the, but the community accepted it because there was a benefit to the community of doing so. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is, Bike lanes are important, but it is sometimes a choice between bike lanes and on-street parking in retail districts. How do you balance these two priorities? Yeah, so um, in LA, uh, a lot of the bike lane projects actually have not displaced the on-street parking, but reduced the number of lanes and road diets. So the impact has been on congestion level. Um, but if you're going to eliminate uh, on-street parking, the key is how else, how can you design a system that will make parking work? If there are spaces behind stores that are underutilized, um, um, you can develop wayfinding schemes, signage schemes, incentives to get people to park in those seldom used spaces or to get the workers in the in the restaurants and, and stores to use another mode to get to work. So you'd wanna do an assessment of the total parking inventory in the district and then assess how many spaces are you losing to a conversion to a bike lane or a bus lane uh, and how can you make up for that? Um, now, usually the removal of curb spaces is a small percentage of the total spaces, but on the other hand, they're like gold to people. They're the most attractive spaces because they're right in front of the destination. So I would say making sure you have enough total inventory, designing a proactive campaign to explain how this is happening and how it works. Also finding local merchants who are champions for the bike lane, because often the dynamic is merchants say, this is gonna put us out of business. Um, but in LA, for example, we found that there are some merchants who say, no, I'd like to have a parklet in front of my business, and I'm happy to give up those two parking spaces. So um, often the controversy of this requires innovation and program development and pilot projects, trying it out, doing reversible things that you can reverse, not permanent changes, and see if it works and assess and evaluate it. Thanks, Rick. Uh, kind of a similar question, a little different. Um, how do you address and balance parking challenges and needs along a commercial corridor with multiple municipalities that have different codes and desires? Yeah, that's um, for, you know, in Southern California, we have many, many small jurisdictions and the consumer, the driver, the parker doesn't under, necessarily understand when they're crossing a jurisdictional border. Um, so one approach is developing a, a corridor approach where you try and create a partnership uh, and collaboration between the various cities that uh, regulate uh, the curb parking and have off-street parking and, and taking that broader corridor approach. Um, so I think the only, the only answer is attempts to coordination and uh, showing that it's in their collective interest to manage the street as a corridor rather than distinct jurisdictional areas. Um, and then on parking requirements, um, often cities do the same thing as their neighbor because they don't uh, want to have a competitive disadvantage for attracting development. So um, again, same thing. If the cities get together and they're all requiring too much, for example, and they agree collectively to reform their requirements, that could be a win-win. 
Okay, thank you, and thanks for all the questions that are coming in. Um, now that we've resolved the audio issues, everybody's very interested in asking questions here. Um, okay, um, here's one. The 12-step program seems to need a lot of data. Are there recommendations for folks with limited resources? Yeah, absolutely. And um, maybe because there's 12 steps, it seems daunting. But my view, I do not want complexity and data requirements to stand in the way of change, right? So I think every step of the way, you want to have the best available data you can get. And clearly, there may be limitations. So just for example, having the first step of knowing parking utilization, using air photo interpretation, which is free, and American Community Survey data on vehicle ownership, which is free. There are some easy ways to do that. But um, because, uh, well, there are lots of observational tools that can be used. Um, for example, you could also study other cities with different parking requirements and try and understand the outcome. So I would say for each of the 12 steps, it's like a logical step, assemble the best data you can with the resources you have. And of course, remember that after the nine steps, that is not the answer. That answer has got to be compared with community objectives, goals, and strategies. So it is really, it's a policy choice. Um, and if I was in a situation where I didn't have all the data I, need, I felt that I wanted, to be absolutely sure, I would make an incremental change and then have a commitment to assess how it's going. Um, if you lowered parking requirements for residential development, do some post-occupancy measurements of what's really happening in those projects and then make an adjustment five years down the road. The, the, the risk of getting it wrong is diminished if parking management tools are used because that's where shared parking could help address a situation where one development didn't have enough parking, but there's excess parking nearby. Great, thank you very much. Here's a question a little different. Um, what about equity? The affluent can afford to pay for parking, but low-income workers and families may have less ability to pay. Yes, no, that's absolutely a, an important issue. Um, so here's an example, uh, you have a, a very vibrant commercial district, the employees working in bars and restaurants, um, perhaps they're not paid that well, and so the city, and, and they're parking in uh, residential neighborhoods to avoid parking charges, the neighbors are up in arms and so on. That's a typical situation. So um, I believe Santa Fe, New Mexico had has a program that provides reimbursement of fees based on an income test. So it is possible to, to rebate um, parking fees if there is clear, the incidence of the parking fee is much a much greater burden for low income people. Um, there's the concept of a transportation wallet, which uh, Portman uses, which is offering, uh, using parking revenues to offer alternative transportation, such as free transit use or free free use of bike share. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a, a very important concern, and I think there are tools to address it, and they just have to be put on the table at the same time as the, as the pricing reform. Okay, thank you. Do you have about uh, 10 more minutes? Uh, we've gotten just a flood of questions here today, and I think everybody's sure, interested thanks. In, sure. in hearing from you. Okay. Um, Next one is then um, shared parking agreements. How do you keep them as simple and durable as possible? For example, do attorneys have to be involved and how can they stay in place if the tenants change? Yeah, so I have seen situations where shared parking arrangements have gone wrong because of either a poor agreement or failed implementation. So for example, uh, one example is um, the office workers were supposed to park on the upper stories and the retail people were lower stories and the office workers started 
parking on the lower stories and there was an enforcement to make sure that would happen and then the whole thing kind of fell apart. So um, I, if resources are available, I do think uh, you need a, a strong legal agreement um, about how that's going to work. And then I think what needs to be made specific is the commitment to how is this going to be monitored and enforced over time. If, if the shared parking agreement is silent on that, then there could be difficulties down the line. Um, and, you know, so this is where I take uh, more of a strategic plan approach to parking management of, of creating a game plan for how a shared parking resource will be used and making sure there, there is, you know, um, a substantial industry of parking management professionals that are moving beyond simply ticketing and gate arm enforcement of pricing. So the, the parking industry, if it's an industry, is moving fast towards developing more sophisticated techniques. So you, uh, if, in addition to a lawyer, it might be uh, appropriate to bring in uh, a parking operator to either advise, help write the agreement, or to contract with an operator to make sure the agreement provisions are enforced. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question here is, uh, since parking demand is very site specific and specific to a particular business versus generic use types, why not eliminate parking requirements and have the parking for a particular development determined on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, depending on those specific circumstances? Um, yeah, that's a fair question. I, I think cities have not done that just to avoid the complexity of determining exactly what the parking demand would be for a particular use. And also because they know that the use will change many times over the course of the building's lifetime. So, uh, but having said that, I mean, one approach is instead of having a minimum requirement, having an obligation for the developer to provide an access plan. And that access plan could include a certain amount of parking. It could include, uh, transit passes, it could include provisions for monitoring how people get to the site and commitments that run with the land to make sure that access works and that the project does not negatively influence its neighbors uh, through overspill. So um, I thought the question was going to why not just eliminate them and let the developer decide, which I think is a good reasonable idea to consider if you're doing proper parking management of public parking. But I think the, the direct answer to the question is um, planners have felt comfortable grouping uses into types um, such as office. Um, but with the emergence of form-based codes, we're moving away from use regulation to form regulation. So uh, in a way, uh, some districts are moving towards even broader application of a certain parking requirement, regardless of use, just thinking of it as a cont contributing to the parking inventory in the district at a certain amount. And because restaurants and, and are disincentivized because they usually have very high parking requirements, but if they're part of a mixed use district, uh, there's a move towards a single parking requirement for all uses in the district. Okay, thanks, Rick. Here's a question from earlier on in your presentation. Um, are you proposing using a utilization rate when parking is free? It seems like you'd be encouraging driving, which is often against the city's climate goals and so on. Yeah, exactly. And I'm, if I didn't, if I didn't emphasize that, I, I will reinforce it now. Measuring existing parking utilization often builds in a condition in which it is free, which which I think <clears throat> shouldn't be. People should pay to park. So, uh, but it's, but it, it, but equally so, you want to know what the existing conditions are on the ground. So, for example, if if you knew what the parking utilization was when it's free, 
<clears throat> and you and you understood the pricing regime should be in place, you could use elasticity estimates to to adjust that downward. But yes, absolutely, there's nothing sacred or inherently correct about <clears throat> the amount you measure because it's distorted by by free parking. Okay, thanks, Rick. Um, can you address the challenge of code enforcement? For example, going back to the developer and forcing them to build more parking based on the performance requirement. Yes, I mean, <clears throat> that's not part of the traditional development entitlement process of many cities, at least in my experience. I started out as a planner in a redevelopment agency <clears throat> where it was more common to have agreements that were recorded as covenants on the title of the land and there was a commitment to monitoring and going back and enforcing the agreement. So <clears throat> I acknowledge it's a big change in practice from traditional zoning entitlements where if you meet the requirements and once a certificate of occupancy is issued, the city planners have no more leverage over you other than code enforcement of basic uh, health and safety conditions. So <clears throat> there is this opportunity. It is a move to a different model of performance-based entitlement, which has significant implications for staffing levels of city departments and requires a commitment to enforcement over time. And so I'm not saying this is an easy thing, but I'm saying there's a significant upside to moving towards this approach because we would not be, in this case, overbuilding parking as we have in the past. Okay, thank you, and thanks for all the questions. We'll just take a, a couple more um, here. Um, let me just go back down, sorry. Okay, while retail at the ground of a parking, at the ground floor of a parking garage is great in principle, our community, even before COVID, had a glut of re retail space, uh, requires it in our regulations, and now we're stuck. How do you make the ordinance flexible enough to account for changes in the economic client, uh, climate? Yeah, that's a that's a great point. And I think for a while planners just thought, well, let's require the developer to ring the bottom floor of this structure with retail, not knowing if there was uh, a sufficient demand or if the demand con conditions change. So <clears throat> I guess uh, if I was looking for flexibility, first would be considering different land uses than retail because uh, I was on a, a webinar with the former mayor of Portland who was talking about the nationalization of retail, especially with the COVID crisis, that, that small businesses are really hurting and, and may not fully recover. So question is, are there other community uses such as childcare uh, or other facilities that are appropriate for those spaces? And if, if there are not, <clears throat> then um, design treatments that avoid a blank wall along the side of the parking structure might be a second best approach. So I think um, I, it's a very good point to, to say that cities should assess the, the, the demand for retail before in, insisting on it on the bottom of all parking structures. Um, <clears throat> you know, maybe uh, you, you, you wrap the structure with uh, residential and, and, and have a structure inside and, and frontage as residential. So it's a great point. And, uh, and I think uh, if, if it's already happened, then finding alternative community uses for those spaces would be, would be the best approach. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have any suggestions for rapidly growing edge suburbs with no transit and no historic walkable areas? We've debated parking maximums to restrict overparking impacts in commercial centers. Yeah, I think uh I think a maximum <clears throat> is appropriate if what developers are seeking to build uh would undermine a long-term vision for livability and mixed uses and relationships between land uses. So 
Um, if, yeah, I worked on a, a new urbanist community in Oxnard, which is a suburban uh, community and had a retail district and they were trying to achieve walkability and the, the residential was at higher density um, and there's a target there and um, I don't know how it happened, but the target uh, built the building over a ground level parking and therefore reduced the footprint of of parking area. It didn't make it like a downtown, but it was definitely better than the traditional way of the building sitting on the ground surrounded by parking. It, it also had parking around it, but it was less. So I think exploring um, design solutions that would uh, reduce the impact of high parking requirements uh, on the future of the district. The other thing I would point out is <clears throat> having a, a long-term strategy, whereas if it's true that parking uh, vehicle ownership, hustle vehicle ownership will decline, designing a new community area purposefully with areas that are surface parking now that will transition to a use. Because in the past, we really didn't design anticipating that, but if you anticipate that, you might live with their high parking supply. Essentially, they're doing a form of land banking, and some of that parking can be repurposed in the future. My other idea that I don't know if anyone's done is temporarily repurposing parking. So for example, a shopping mall uh, needs, has the highest parking demand in November, December, around that, the holiday shopping season. Why not repurpose part of that parking lot to demonstrate urban gardening with raised bed gardens that could be removed once a year? Just thinking of activating these spaces with, with, with community uses um, is another idea of dealing with the transition from existing car dependency to that visioned future where it's a more uh, walkable place. Great, thanks Rick. And thanks everybody who um, submitted questions. We have many more, but I think we'll go in and stop here. Um, and I'll mention also that I took some of the information about your books out of the intro because I uh, wanted to keep it concise, but you may want to, as part of your uh, final comments here, maybe mention, to folks how to get your books, because I know there's a lot of good information there that we didn't cover today. And then in addition, if you have any other kind of closing thoughts for us. Oh, sure. Um, the books are on the Island Press website. And uh, if you use, uh, if you look under my name, Wilson with two L's, you'll find them. And if you use the discount code webinar, you'll get a 30% discount. Um, but to conclude, um, I think Perfect is the enemy of the good in the case of parking reform. I'm encouraging planners to do what they can with the resources they have and get us moving in a direction where parking is not the tail that wags the dog of transportation planning, but parking is playing an appropriate role in a larger land use vision and transportation vision. So I'm very sorry about the audio problems, but thank you so much for attending and your interest in this topic. Great. Thank you, Rick. And thanks, everybody, who uh, stayed on today and uh, made it through our audio issues. Uh, this will conclude our webinar, Parking Reform Made Easy. I'd like to offer a great big thank you to Richard Wilson for a great presentation, to everyone who attended today, and to John Coleman, our communications and technology guru, who helps to make this all happen. The complete recording of today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org. Also, for those of you who have requested one, all attendees will receive an email that will contain a link to a personalized certificate of participation. Please look for this follow-up email. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. If you can take a few moments to provide feedback, uh, that way we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. And I will mention that uh, a lot of the comments about uh, the need to do a parking webinar led to this one today, so that uh, we definitely review what you all send to us. Uh, keep an eye on smartgrowth.org and your email inbox for details on other future webinars, including COVID-19 and the future of planning next week with Petra Hurtado and Joe Pina of the American Planning Association, which will be next Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Have a great day. <laughs>